Matthew chapter number 5, greatest recorded message in the history of mankind. Goes all the way through chapter number 7, Sermon on the Mount. But, before we get started and read and keep in mind, the book of Matthew was written to the Hebrews. So in hindsight, when it talks about their father, that's our heavenly father, but at this point, Jesus hadn't died yet. We weren't grafted into the vine. There were certain things that still needed to come to fruition, but as a result of what Jesus did, we now have become partakers of the same thing that was promised to them. So Matthew chapter number 5, go down to verse number 48. Jesus says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, those of you that are students of the Bible, understand that that word perfect does not mean sinless. That word perfect does not mean holy, does not mean righteous. It means complete. When the Bible talks about Job and it says that Job was a perfect man, upright man who feared God and eschewed evil, that does not mean he was sinless. It meant that his faith was perfect. It wasn't missing anything. Now, God is perfect because he is holy. Because of his holiness, he is also righteous, he is perfect, he is sinless. Those are characteristics that point to, not that point to him being holy, but are results of him being holy, if that makes sense. God is not perfect because his perfectness makes him holy. God is perfect because he is holy, and he just happens to be perfect. Okay? But when it says, be ye therefore perfect, it's not talking about sinless. Okay, Jesus knew that you would sin after you got saved. Jesus knew that even though it hadn't been pinned down yet, he knew that one day he was going to tell John over in 1 John that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And he knew that John wasn't going to write that verse. That's not directed at lost folk. That's directed at church people. People that have already been saved. Jesus knew that you were going to sin after you got saved. He shed blood not just to save you from sin, but also to cleanse you from all the sin after you got saved. That he knew that you also were going to commit. It's not talking about be sinless. He says, be ye therefore perfect. Now we ought to strive to be sinless. We ought to strive to be conformed as much as we possibly can to the image of Jesus Christ. But it says, Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, but Ron, I'm just simple-minded enough to believe that if God told you to do something, He knows that you're capable of doing it. He's not going to tell you to do something that you cannot do, because then He would be making you a sinner. If He knows that you cannot do it, but yet He commands you to do it, then He knows that you're going to be guilty of sin. It's his will that none should perish and all should come to repentance. Well, how can one come to repentance if there's no way for them to escape being a sinner? Right? If God condemned you afterwards to have sin and iniquity in your life always, right? that kind of undoes a little bit of what he intended for you. Because I know if I regard iniquity in my heart that he'll not even hear my prayers. Why would God command you to pray if he knew that always you would have iniquity and sin in your heart? Because he gave a commandment that he knew that you couldn't keep. That doesn't make sense. So we know that God said it because God expects it. And God expects it because he knows that you're capable of it. Not because it's something you can't do, but rather because it's something you can do. In fact, a lot of times throughout the Bible, people did not understand how close they could get to God until they finally submitted to getting as close as they possibly can to God. Until they submitted themselves to God's will and said, all right, Lord, I don't know how it's going to work, but we're going to try it anyway. Then they find out how much God really wanted to do for them. Right, well, be ye therefore perfect. Not talking about the church, he's talking to you. 
He's talking to everybody, but he's also talking just to you. I've said there's a difference between the word y'all and all y'all. There's a difference between you and y'all. They all start with the same letter and they all sound similar, right? But I could be talking to y'all and then I could be talking to all y'all. And I can be talking to you. Right? Intention makes it very important. That's why the Bible, everybody harping on uh, that, well, why has it got to sound the way that it does? Because God wrote it this way so that you'd understand it exactly the way that God intended you to understand it. What he says, be ye therefore perfect, yes, he's talking to everybody in attendance that day. But that ye is a specific ye. It's a personal ye. It's talking to you individually. He knew that there's going to be thousands there to hear him that day. But in this verse, he's talking to each one of them individually. He's saying, I'm talking to you, and I'm talking to you, and I'm talking to you. Be ye therefore perfect. We've just glossed over in this same chapter, right? In this same message, the Sermon on the Mount, right? Don't pay attention to the moat in somebody else's eye when you've got a beam sticking out of your own. He's not telling you to go around and hold up a stick of perfection and measure other people to it. No, be ye therefore perfect. Don't worry about your neighbor. You know what you're supposed to do with your neighbor? All the laws fulfilled in this. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. And the second great commandment, which is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. You do those two things, according to the law, you're going to be blameless. Not according to Brother Jordan's opinion, but according to Jesus. But this isn't talking about you relating to other people. That's how you're supposed to treat other people. This is how you're supposed to judge yourself. Be ye therefore perfect. You know what else you'll find? Chapter number 7 of this book. Judge not lest ye be judged. A lot of Baptists don't like that verse. But it does say that whatever measure you judge others with, it'll be meted unto you. But the only way to avoid being judged, right, to do it to where it's the right way, it's you judging yourself. If you judge yourself according to God's standards on this side, you'll be able to stand complete before him when you stand before him in judgment because you have submitted yourselves to judgment on this side so that you don't have to face the judgment of God on that side. Now am I saying, but this is not a holier than thou speech, Brother Ed. Right? I know there are things that I do daily that as soon as the Holy Ghost convicts me of it, I know I'm going to have to give an account of that one day. But you know what else I know? If it gets under the blood, God don't remember it. It's gone. It's those things that I hang on to where I don't want to admit that I was wrong. Those are the things that because I did not judge myself or submit myself to God's judgment here, I have to give an account of it over there because it didn't get put under the blood. Because there was something I was too stubborn to admit to the Lord that I was wrong or that I made a mistake, or that I simply didn't want to obey. I'll remind you that the sin of rebellion is his witchcraft. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? It's very simple. He said, be ye therefore perfect. Then he gave you the reason. Even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. He says, I'm not asking you to do something for your own glory. I'm asking you to identify with your heavenly Father because he identifies with you. He called you his people. Right now, yeah, he's talking to the Hebrews, but afterwards, when that vine, or the branch got grafted into the vine, what do you think happened to it? Well, according to the Bible, you became a joint heir with Jesus Christ. If Israel was God's chosen people, he promised you that you receive the same position as Christ in God's eyes. Now, those Israelites that are alive today anybody that's been alive since Jesus came you know how they get the glory same way you do under the blood that changes in the great tribulation but that's a different dispensation right now there's no difference between Jew and Greek God removed that wall of partition he ripped the veil from top to bottom on the day that Jesus was crucified who was the one that told Israel to make the veil God God 
who decided when the veil and the time of the veil, the time of separation between the mercy seat or which was a picture of God, right? Who decided that there was no more separation between God and man and then between man and Gentile? Man didn't make the decision to put those separations in place. God did. So who decided when they were removed? God. And he symbolized it by not ripping a... I mean, I could throw this handkerchief to you. And some of y'all would have a little bit of struggle just ripping this. It's not the finest made, right? It's not some thousands of thread count handkerchief. No, it's just a break of the piece of cloth. You know that that veil was as thick as a man's hand, as the width of a man's hand? You couldn't rip that on your own. And it didn't say that it was cut, it was ripped. It wasn't a clean separation like somebody took a knife or a sword to it. It was ripped. That means it was all burst. It was pulled apart. You can tell the difference between something's pulled apart and when something's cut. Why did he do it that way? To prove that man didn't do it, that it was a sign of God. All to symbolize what? That you, not because you're holy, not because you are anything special, but because of what God put in you, you can be perfect even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. He identified with you so much that he came down and made himself a little lower than an angel like we talked about a few years ago, or a few weeks ago. And he spent some 33 and a half years in the flesh so that you could identify with him. God saw your need and he loved you. But God came down so that man could see him and identify themselves with their Savior. Because there's been people ever since mankind existed they've been walking around in nature knowing that something created everything else because nothing that has been made was made by anything else that you can see that's what the Bible says that we're without excuse not to know that there's a creator based off of his handiwork but you can't identify with a God that you can't wrap your head around that you can't understand so what Jesus do he said just yoke up with me by faith put your my yoke on your shoulders submit to it I promise that my yoke is easy and my burden is light in fact you can cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you because he wants you to be unburdened but why did Jesus come in the manner that he did one because it pleased God first and foremost it's God's will but one of the benefits of Christ's coming is that you identified with him in the flesh and then afterwards he said he must go so that the comforter could come if Jesus hung around the Holy Ghost wouldn't have been able to come the way that the Holy Ghost is nowadays and he gave you through his earthly ministry a picture of how to identify with Christ after the flesh but then he gave you his spirit so that you could identify with him in spirit does not the Bible say that his spirit bears witness with our spirit you know how the Holy Ghost talks to you? Exactly how God wants you to understand it. Amen. You know how the Holy Ghost convicts you? Exactly how God knows that you need to be convicted. Amen. You know why God didn't leave conviction up to man? Because man's real good at making you feel miserable about a whole bunch of stuff, but rarely is it what God's concerned about. It's usually with what man's concerned about. And if everything don't know how we got on this but if everything is all about what's on the outside God's not so interested on the outside God knows if you get what's on the inside cleaned up that it's going to work its way out Jesus said that it's not what goes into a man that defiles him but what's on the inside that defiles the body if you've got wickedness in your heart it's going to defile you the way that you live the way that you dress and everything else but if you've got the right spirit and if you're in fellowship with God he's going to make changes on the inside that work their way out you know why man's always concerned with what's on the outside because that's all man can see as the Bible says man looketh on the outward appearance you know what God sees God sees who you are where you are exactly what you need and he already knows exactly what it's going to take to get you to where you need to be how does the Holy Ghost does things the perfect way that God wants it to be done why does he convict why does he 
instruct us? Why does he lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake? Not for ours, but for his. Because he wants you to be perfect. Complete. If you study your Bible, there's nothing that God told you to do that he hasn't already, through the word of God, prepared what you need to be equipped to go and do it. He didn't tell you to go without giving you a means to go. He didn't tell you to pray without giving you exactly what God expects every time that you pray. He didn't tell you to witness without telling you to go and do it through the power and the unction of the Holy Ghost. Those that are called to preach, He doesn't tell them to go and preach without giving them a message. Those that He tells to go and witness, He doesn't tell them to go witness where doors haven't been opened to witness. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying that God told you to be perfect, meaning complete. So we're getting back to that. Perfect. What is perfect when it comes to context in verse number 48? Well, we've already gone through the beginning portion of chapter number 5 by this point, which is the Beatitudes. We're told to be the light of the world, salt of the earth. Okay, after this, it's verse number 1 of chapter number 6, he talks about not doing your alms openly among men. You do your alms because, one, God told you to do them, but two, because you want to meet somebody else's need as God has met one of your needs. And you do it in secret so that God gets all the glory for it. But they did their alms before men. Why? Because they wanted the acclaim of men. What's he saying? He's saying be perfect. Be complete. You know when God does something for somebody? He doesn't send a whirlwind or he doesn't send a raging fire. He doesn't send right a chorus of angels coming by playing trumpets and singing songs to announce that he did something you know where he touches people inwardly in secret God doesn't make a big show of you and put you on a pedestal and turn a spotlight on it and say look at what I did in this person's life no he does it inwardly so that what he does inwardly he expects you to glorify and to give him credit for it outwardly but he says be perfect be complete but when God saved you he didn't give you half a salvation he gave you whole salvation when God gave you the word of God I understand that there are places in the world today that they don't have a copy of the word of God which is a tragedy in and of itself but it's not because there's not a complete copy somewhere that it can be translated from to this day, the complete Word of God is still around. Whether it's made its way to every corner of the world, that's more on man than God. Because what God do? He's preserved it to this day. I've got every jot and tittle that He intended to be recorded. I've got it preserved in my lap. We know what the Word of God is. Why? Because He gave you the complete Word of God. You're not going to find a book that was supposed to be in there that it says to be continued. No. There's not one in there that says pending revision. We're going to add this chapter back in. No. How'd God deliver it? Holy. Complete. Perfect. But what's He expect you to be? He expects you to be a complete Christian. Man, let me give you this illustration. Yesterday, see, Brother Clint, Brother Clint's learned this a long time ago, except Brother Clint's tightwad. Brother Clint don't like spending money. I'm the opposite of Brother Clint. If I see something, I'll deny it for a while, and then eventually I'll justify it. Okay? That's between me and God. You don't have any say in between that. But anyway. What'd you go and buy this time, Brother I went out and bought a rifle. Okay? Is it a hunting rifle? No, because I don't hunt. Okay? Would I enjoy hunting? Probably. But I'm not going to eat the meat, so I'm not going to waste it. Right? I bought a rifle to go and shoot targets that are very, very far away and make me feel like I'm a sniper, Okay, even though I'm not. Well, yesterday I went and I finally got the thing sighted in on the range. But the reason I shoot guns, it's not for survival. Right now I've got Kroger. 
you know, those things go very bad in America very quick. I'm not going to have to go hunting anytime soon for food. Okay, I do not go hunting for sport, or I mean, I don't shoot for sport hunting. I think it's wrong to kill something and not use it. The Bible talks about how we're supposed to be thankful for what God blesses us with. God did not bless you with a deer just so you can hang the antlers on the wall. He gave it to you under the understanding that you would use it. Right, maybe that's that very fine amount of native that I've got in me. right? But you ought to use the whole thing that God gave you, as much of it as you can. Oh, not waste. So why does Brother Jordan have a rifle? Because I like mastery of things. Okay, I'm not saying that I am a master of everything. No. There are a few things that I am very good at, but you know why I'm very good at them? Because I'm passionate about being perfect in those things. But there are some things I don't care about. There are other things that I care a whole lot about. But on the things that I care a whole lot about, I care to be good at those things. And not just good, I want to be better than anybody else that I know. Is it a pride thing? No, it's just that if I enjoy something, I want to be the best at it. I want to be able to do the best that I can. And I know if I give it my best, there's going to be a whole lot of people that aren't going to be as good as me. Right? That's just the law of averages. Most people don't care enough to put time and effort into things. If you commit yourself to something, you're going to be better than a whole lot of people right off the bat because you care about it. You're passionate about it. Well, Brother Jordan, why do you need a rifle? Because the other guns that I have, I'm already real good with them. It's not fun to go and shoot them at the range anymore because I know where I point it, it's going to hit. But I had somebody ask me one time, Brother Jordan, why do you carry a full-size magazine? Why don't you carry a compact? Why don't you get one of these little itty-bitty guns? Well, first off, Bigfoot hands, okay, little itty-bitty guns don't fit in mine, Okay. To, you know, if I get one of them, I go to grab it, and then my whole hand is around the whole back of the the grip. Like it's, it don't it don't work. Okay, but two, I rarely miss, never miss seventeen times. Why? Because I've taken that thing, and I know where I point it. It's gonna hit. It's not fun. It's not a challenge anymore. Right? It's just instinctual at this point. So what I do? I went out and I got another one, and guess what? Same thing. Start off, trigger was too heavy. What I do? I lightened it up. I made, I mastered the gun. I made the gun work for me. And now what happens? Now I go and shoot it. It's got less recoil than a handgun does because all the stuff I've added to the front of the barrel. And what happens? Where I point it, that's where it hits. But well, I do not live. I live in the city. Okay, they're not real fond of you just putting a target up a couple of hundred yards away and just laying down in the road and shooting. Okay. <laughs> So I had to find a place to go and shoot. Well, thankfully, we got this fellow in the church named Brother Jim. Brother Jim got a farm. And he's got a couple of hundred. Uh, you know, I didn't get out. It took me all day yesterday just to sight the stupid thing in. And it's a brand new barrel. You just got to run stuff through it and knock off the rough edges down the inside of the barrel before it can be any accurate. But what you say, Brother Jim, yesterday I knew. Okay, this is, y'all know me. Right? I'm as white as Nosferatu, okay? I do not enjoy sunlight. I do not enjoy heat. I'm built like a polar bear. Give me the cold. Right? Nick got real hot yesterday. Well, I gave enough forethought to it to think, uh, I don't feel like putting suntan lotion on, so I'm just going to wear one of my long sleeve like, summer shirts that real breezy and everything. Didn't help. I'm still sunburnt right here on both hands. Because that's where my hands were when I was looking down the barrel. And then I was like, I'm just going to put a hat on. Well, when you're looking like this, from here over, I am sunburned. But from here over, I am not. Because the bill of the hat was just giving me shade right here. Well, he's like, I gave it some forethought, not enough. But yesterday, I keep shooting things. What happens? I'm making adjustments. I'm shooting a group. Doing what? Seeing how the barrel likes it. I use different types of ammunition. Because some guns just don't like certain types of ammo. Why? I don't know. they got personalities. Right? But some of them don't like heavier bullets. Some of them like lighter bullets. What did I do? I just bought a whole bunch of different types. Ran them all through. What is that? By the end of the day, at 100 yards, I could fire off three shots, and they'd all hit within a size about that big. Is it perfect? No. 
Because if you take it out to 200, that circle gets twice as big. And at 300, it's three times as big as what I've got on paper right now. What happened? That was just getting it in the ballpark. Now I got to go and I got to further refine it. I got to find out window, you know, windage holdovers and elevation changes and everything. Then, if you really want to get into it, right? If you want to be like the guys that do the really, really long, they're guys that shoot out over a mile away. In order to do that, you've got to start taking not only the curvature of the Earth into effect. You have to, because of which hemisphere you're in, you've got to start doing mathematical calculations for the Coriolis effect. You say, you going to do all that, Brother Jordan? I don't think I'm that good. But I'm good, I'm, I know I'm way too good for just 100 yards. I need longer. Got to go out further. Why? To see if I go out that far, how do I make it all to hit within a small spot again? But are there any trophies? No, I'm just doing it because I like it. I don't like firearms because they go boom, and I don't like firearms because you could just sit there and pull the trigger real fast to get an adrenaline rush. Right? I like it because it's something that's simple. You pull trigger, it hit target. Well, no. You pull trigger, it go boom. If you pull trigger and aim it in the right direction, then it hit target. But you pull the trigger too hard, you yank it, what's going to happen? Bullet not going to hit target. It's not just a mastery of mechanism. It is a mastery of self. But it's the same thing as a lot of people used to go out and do martial arts. That is not, you know, come to find out, a lot of them aren't the most effective fighting style. Okay, but what was it? It was discipline. It was to condition and train yourself. But what are you saying, Brother Jordan? Well, I like doing it. So I want to be as good as I can. Do I get to do it all the time? No, because I don't have a long farm. Do I get to do it occasionally? Yep. And by the time I get around to doing it again, I've forgotten everything that I learned the last time I went and did it, and i got to do it all over again. What are you saying? I'm saying if you care about something, you care not just about being good, you want to be perfect. Parents ought to desire to be the best perfect parent that they can be. Why? Because that child is an inherited, inherited to the Lord. God entrusted you with that child to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I believe that children ought to be passionate about being the perfect child for their parents. I believe that church members ought to desire to be a perfect church member. Why? Because God fitly framed you together in this local called out body of believers. He made a place for you that only you could fill so that you could be a part of what he has started. Well, if God cared that much about you being here, I believe you ought to be concerned about being a perfect church member in the eyes of God. I believe that you ought to strive. And let me just say this. I believe it, but I believe it because it's in the book. You want chapter and verse, come and see me after Sunday school. But I believe when it gets down to you talking with God, you ought to strive for perfect prayer. According to the Bible, that means that your spirit and God's spirit are perfectly aligned and there's no more you've got to repent in order to get things made right with God. There's no more Him convicting you because there are certain things that you don't realize. It means your will and God's will are perfectly aligned and you can finally have true fellowship. That's what perfect prayer is. It means that the words that are coming out of your mouth are the exact words that God wishes you to pray. And it means that you're staying there long enough and you're waiting on an answer on the other end of the line that... You're not going to do anything until he says to do it. I believe that Christians ought to love their God perfectly or completely. You know what God says about it? He says the same thing. We've already quoted it. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy... Another passage, with all thy strength. With everything you got, you ought to love God. Why? Because that's how God loves you. But if you love God with everything you've got, I don't understand how people can claim to do that. Yep, God's first in my life. Okay? Well, if you love it that much, how come you don't care about being perfect? Because, hey, I don't even love going and shooting guns. 
Right? There's enough of an inconvenience there where I'm like, ah, it's hot. Right? I might talk myself out of it one day. It's not where, it, you know, you've heard our pastor talk about there was a time in his life where he was brain damaged and people would say, hey, you want to go play this sport? And it didn't matter what it was. Well, it didn't matter. He wasn't playing soccer. But, hey, you want to go do something? He'd drop whatever he was doing and go play baseball. Why? Because he loved it. Nothing was going to stop him. But what are you saying, Brother George? If you love something, nothing's going to get in the way of it. I just liked going out and shooting that rifle. Yet it took a whole day to go do it. Why? Because I wanted to get it right. And I knew I wasn't going to get it perfect, but I knew it was going to be more right than it was at the beginning of the day. Why well, is that next time I can get it closer and closer and closer? What well, are you saying, Brother Jordan? How come Christians don't treat God and their spirituality that way? You know what God expects you to be? Perfect. God expects that when things come up in your life and you look at them through that scope like I was doing yesterday, you know exactly where to turn that dial for that distance. Why? Because you're perfect. You know what you're able, you're capable of doing and what you're not capable of doing. You are humble, which means that you know all your strengths and all your weaknesses and you abide therein. You know what you can do and you know what you rely upon God to do for you. And you do what you can and have faith that God will do what you cannot. God expects you, when you put that finger on the trigger, you know exactly how hard to pull it to make that thing go off. Because if you pull too hard, you're going to be most likely right, and you're going to be up. Because you yanked it this way, off the trigger. And if it went left, that's because you flinched. You knew there was going to be a bang, and you knew it was going to hit you in the shoulder, and you didn't like it, so you flinched as you were pulling the trigger. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? God expects that when he tells you to do something, you do it perfect. In fact, I believe that God only asks people to do things that have, because the Bible says, to be a steward of man must require that men be found faithful. God's not going to ask you to do anything until you're already faithful. But, in order to do anything that means anything, You've got to be perfect. You know what God expected of Jesus when he told Christ, come, be born of a virgin? He expected perfection. Yes, he was also sinless, and he was righteous, and he was holy, but he didn't expect Jesus to have one thing that he was required to do that he wasn't capable of doing it. You know what perfect really means? That whatever God allows to enter your, into your life, you're able to handle it. There's a whole lot of doctrines that are required to come up to being perfect in the eyes of God. But he didn't say, be righteous. All of my righteousness is his filthy rags. I'm just borrowing Jesus's until I get a body like his. I'm robed in his righteousness because mine's not good enough. He didn't say to go out there and earn your own salvation because he knew that as a check I'd never be able to earn enough to write. He didn't go out there and he didn't tell us take dirt and make man out of it. What did he tell you to be? He told you to be perfect. Later on he tells you to be ye holy as I am holy. Why? Because he knows you can do it. What's he expect of you? Same thing he expects out of everybody else. God's not asking you to do anything unreasonable or unfair or that is particularly burdensome to you. It's not cruel and unusual punishment. It's the same thing that God has expected from the beginning. Why? Because when Christ came, he fulfilled the law, which was God's expectations. You know what God's measuring stick always has been? Christ. We said that last week. You know what revival is? It's where people get fired up, they get that fire that was in them stoked again, that maybe it died down a little bit or gone out them embers get to crackling again that passion gets rather than what people get concerned about being perfect again if I don't care about it I don't care about being perfect if I get content 
on, you know, there's a difference between com content and complacent. If I get content, that means that I'm happy with where I'm at, not because I'm satisfied with it, but because God said he is satisfied with where I'm at. If you're passionate about something, you're going to keep pressing on until you reach the mark. But if you get complacent, you could care less. You don't even want to take the rifle out of the box because you know that it's going to take effort to get it to where it needs to be. Now you want it easy. Because complacency doesn't like perfect. Because in order to be perfect, you got to constantly be vigilant. To be complete, you've always got to be asking the Lord if there's anything that's missing in your life. You know what that takes? Effort. Not just effort and seeking out the answer, but effort and waiting. Don't know about you, but Jordan's not a very patient person. I'm more patient than I used to be, Brother Randy. But God hadn't convicted me enough to pray about adding more patience to it yet. You say, you got a short fuse? Yeah, but it's just a whole lot wetter now. It takes a whole lot to get lit. It's not easy to light anymore. But if that sucker gets lit, watch out. Pompeii is about ready to happen again. But see, patience is a necessity as a Christian. Go study out the instructions that we're supposed to add unto faith. Patience. Let patience have her perfect work. You know what patience is? Patience is the hallmark of a mature or perfect Christian. You know what's easy to do? Fret. It's easy to worry. It's easy to be busy about something when you don't know what to do, so you just want to go and do something. See, Martha, sister of Lazarus and Mary, the very sun and glories in her head. She has no idea what that was. Well, I don't know. What we're, we weren't expecting this today. What she knows. She knows she needs to do something. So she just starts making a meal for everybody. Then she comes in. Lord, tell her to come in here and help me. And he says, she's right where she needs to be. He was the one that got all up in a tizzy and decided you needed to do all this. You know what's hard to do? When the Lord says, wait, you just wait. Because he doesn't tell you how long you're going to be waiting. He doesn't tell you how long it's going to be until maybe one of them ravens come by and drops off of some food for you. He doesn't tell you how long you're going to be walking down this road or waiting on him to come back. Patience is the hallmark of a complete Christian. Because a perfect Christian, God can tell them to do something and that's all they're going to do. No more, no less. And they're going to do it until God tells them stop doing it. The hallmark of being in control of your flesh is that you're able to control what words come out of your mouth, according to the book of James. If any man can tame the whole body, he is a perfect man. Hallmark of a perfect Christian is that you don't live after the flesh. You compel the flesh to live spiritually. Not just through word, but through work and through deed. It's easy to say it. It's hard to do it. Because if you're passionate, you're also committed. You're committed not just to being faithful to God, being patient, being long-suffering towards others. You're also committed to you remaining what God wants you to be. You can rein that flesh in. You're willing to put the effort in, not just because you're passionate, but because you care about how your life reflects the Savior. You've heard me give this analysis before. Jesus said that ye are the light of the world, but we have no light in and of ourselves. The only thing in this flesh that I've got is darkness, blindness, death. He told you that ye are the light of the world. Well, if you had your own light, you wouldn't need this, which he told you was a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. 
Why is this a lie to the world? Because the Bible says that he was the word made flesh. This is light because he is light. When he put his spirit inside of you to indwell you, that you are now the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost, you know what that is? That's light unto you. Because what's the Holy Ghost's job? To lead and guide you into all truth. Well, he uses this light to what? Point it into your life and show you what's really there. When he says that ye are the light of the world, it's not because there's anything special about you that can turn on the light bulb in somebody's head that shows them that they're a, save, they're a sinner and they're in need of a Savior. You know whose job that is? That's the Holy Ghost's job. You know how he does that? He convicts you to go and witness to somebody, but unbeknownst to you, he's already been working on them. And he's just using you as the delivery vessel to get the message to them. Because God chose to use people to impact other people. When God chose to make an impact in your life, who did he send? He sent himself robed in flesh. He used a fleshly body to impact your fleshly life. Because right, he does all things well. Jesus didn't appear in the sky and say that he was going to come and die on the cross that day so that everybody could be forgiven. God's been saying that for thousands of years before this. Why did he come and do it? To do it perfect and complete. So that your salvation, you could take hope and you could have confidence in the fact that it was done perfectly. That there's nothing that needs to be eaten, you know, added to, taken away from it to make it what God expected it to be. Your salvation is perfect in and of itself. It's not dependent upon you. It's dependent upon the Christ. I know that the Bible says if we yield to Him. I know that the Bible says that if we give over control of our life, we give over the control of the concerns of life, and we remove our will and substitute it with the will of God, we know that according to the Bible that if you let God work in your life, you'll be exactly what God wants you to be. He's promised it. Well, if you know that it's been promised that God's going to make you into a new creature, one who doesn't look like the old, just looks like the new now, if you know that that has been promised, why wouldn't you let Him do it? Because people aren't passionate. People got no drive to do it. What's camp mean? What's revival? What's all that about? Stoking that back up again? Why? So that you will be concerned about being perfect once more. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on daily devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.